21st Precinct. It's just lines on the map of the city of New York. Most of the 173,000 people wedged into the nine-tenths of a square mile between Fifth Avenue and the East River wouldn't know if you asked them that they lived or worked in the 21st. Whether they know it or not, the security of their homes, their persons, and their property is the job of the men of the 21st Precinct. The 21st. 160 patrolmen, 11 sergeants, and 4 lieutenants, of whom I'm the boss. My name is Cronin, Vincent P. Cronin. I'm captain in command of the 21st Precinct. I was doing day duty, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Tours of duty vary like the weather. Some are quiet, others are stormy. This tour was a stormy one. When I came on the job at 7.30 a.m., a three-alarm fire in an old brewery near the East River had just been brought under control. Two city firemen had been overcome and taken to Metropolitan Hospital. At 8.16 a.m., a bus and a taxi cab collided on 2nd Avenue. The driver of the cab and his two passengers were injured. Shortly after 9 o'clock, there was a call that a paint store on Lexington Avenue had been burglarized during the night. I was still at the scene of the accident when Patrolman Farrell, my operator, rang into T.S. from a call box and informed me of the burglary. We made the run to Lexington Avenue. The men from Sector 4 and Sergeant Tierney were already on the job. Farrell parked between their cars in front of the paint store. All right, let's go. Hello, Captain. What do we got, Ross? A safe job. Yeah. They hauled it away. They just rolled it out. The front door carried it away. All right. Uh, don't touch the door, Captain. That's the way they got in and out. Okay. Sergeant Jenny says the detectives might want to try it for fingerprints. All right. Stay in the job here. Keep the sidewalk clear. Yes, sir. Uh, what time do you usually open the door, Mr. Ristola? It's the same time. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock every day. Hello, Sergeant. Captain. Mr. Ristolis, this is Captain Cronin. How do you do? Uh, some mess to come to work to. Some mess, huh? Mr. Ristolis is a proprietor, Captain. Mr. Peter Ristolis. He opened up this morning and found the place had been burglarized during the night. The whole safe picked up. The whole safe. You'd think the safe would be safe. The whole thing. Did you notify the detective, Sergeant? Yes, sir. I rang in as soon as I saw what it was. And Sally was catching. He notified the safe and lost squad, and he's on his way over here himself. Oh, where was this safe, Mr. Stone? Uh, right back there, Captain. Right back there, in plain view, with a light on it. I always make it a practice to leave a light on it. Right, right here, in between brushes and wallpaper. Oh, what kind of a safe was it, Mr. Stone? A black one. I mean, do you know the name of the manufacturer and the style number? Oh, well, to tell you the truth, no. Well, when did you buy it? Well, let's see. I had it when I removed to this location. I had it about a year. Then I've been here nine years, so I got the safe about ten. It's important the detectives have a description of the safe. Don't you have the manufacturer's name, the model number written down someplace? Well, yes, tell you the truth, I think I do. I think I got the original invoice from when I bought it. Oh, good. That's all we need. Where is the invoice? In the safe. That's a yes. How was the entry made, Sergeant? The door was Jimmy's. Neat job, Captain. They got a bar in between the door and the frame and just snapped off the light. Yeah. And when I walked up to the door, I could see something was screwy. I touched it and it opened. The lock was broken off. Listen, I got my insurance policies in the safe, too. How does that make me stand on the insurance? Boy, you don't need your policies. Just get in touch with your broker. Do you have any cash in the safe? Oh, yeah, sure. That's why I keep the safe, principal. How much? Oh, six, seven hundred dollars. Your receipts from yesterday? Well, most of it. Four or four fifty is the receipts yesterday. The rest is extra cash. I just keep rot. Huh? Why? Well, <clears throat> tell you the truth, Captain, it's a couple of hundred dollars I had I didn't want my wife to know about. You know, mad money. Uh -huh. She knows everything I'm doing and how much I got in the bank to the last nickel. You see, I'm the president and she's the secretary treasurer of this little corporation we got, Ristola Saints and Corporation, and she takes her job serious. I, I figure I'm entitled to a couple of hundred dollars. She don't know about. What is it, six or seven hundred dollars? Well, between, I don't know. I'd have to figure the register and so forth. Well, what else did you have in there, Mr. Stone? Oh, a couple of dollars in stamps. Oh, oh, for crying out loud, my war bonds. My war bonds was no, in there. you won't lose anything there. You have a record of the serial numbers, don't you? Yeah, also in the safe. You sure had a lot of faith in that safe, Mr. Stoller. Well, who'd have thought, you know? Listen, the government will make good on those war bonds, won't they? That's my hard-earned money in those bonds. What happened? You better get in touch with the Treasury Department as soon as you can, Mr. Stoller. Oh, yeah, that's a good idea. Anything else in there, Mr. Ristolis? Oh, my accounts receivable. Listen, how much chance is there of getting them back? I mean, the bonds and the accounts receivable. I don't care about the cash. 
You know, this could develop into an expensive proposition. The Treasury might give me a hard time, and without the accounts receivable, well, to tell you the truth, I'm a dead duck. Accounts payable, who cares? The people I owe, if I don't pay them, will let me know, but the people that owe me aren't going to come around here and volunteer money. No, sir. You, you, you think I can get it back, the contents, besides the cash, I mean? You probably will, Mr. Stolas. All they want is the cash. Your ledgers and war bonds won't do them any good. Oh, that's good news, if only it comes true. Well, what do they do, Sergeant? Roll it along here? Yes, sir. You can see the track. Mm. Right down here and out the door. Must have had a pickup truck or a car waiting. A car? Oh, they couldn't get that safe into a car. You know how big it is? Well, it comes up to here. I'm up, up to here. There must have been nine guys to move it. Look, I haven't had it out of that corner for two years. It was so heavy. Look, look at the dust back there. You were uh, all alone in the store, Mr. Stone? No, that's right, all alone. Except on Saturdays, my wife comes down to give me a hand and work on a book. She's got a job down on Wall Street. On Saturdays, she comes to help me out. And you've always been alone in the store? Well, yeah, for the last three or four years, I used to have help, but it got more than the traffic could bear. I couldn't keep them, and I always had their problems, plus my own. I figured it didn't pay. Twelve guys there must have been to roll that safe out of here. Believe me, it was this big. It was this big and heavy. To... Now, who could that be on the phone? It's a fine time. Well, you better call. answer, Mr. Stoller. It's a fine time for business as usual. Some deal, huh, Captain? Yeah, <laughs> some deal. Had to roll the safe out, cross the sidewalk, up onto a truck. Where was the patrolman on post? Beats uh, me, Captain. What time do you think they broke in, Sergeant? Who? He closes the store at 6 o'clock. He didn't open up until 9 this morning. Could have been any time in between. Yeah, yeah. Sergeant, give me the names of the two men who were on post here for the night tour and for the late tour. Yes, sir. I want to know why they didn't see this burglar in progress or at least discover that the door was Jimmy. Hey, listen, Captain, that telephone's for you. For me? Yeah, I answered it and somebody says, who's the cop in charge there? It was a dame, some dame. I said, there's a captain here. She said, let me talk to the captain. All right, where's the... It, it's back there on the counter, right next to the case. Right. Okay. You don't need all those men here, Sergeant. Get some of them back out of trouble. Yes, sir. Captain Cronin. Are you in charge of the cops there? Who is it? Now, that's not important now, Captain. Well, it's important if you want to talk to me. Now, well, look, if you really want to know who it is, I'm the guy who's got the safe from there. Oh, that's so. Yeah, that's so. I want to make you a little proposition. Well, I don't know whether I want to talk about a proposition with you. Well, whatever we talk about, let's make it fast. I don't want to give you a chance to find out where I'm calling from. All right. I'll make it fast. What do you want? I want the combination. You don't want much, do you? Look, we've been trying to get into that thing all night. We've been trying to rip it. We've been using a torch on it. All we want is the dough, that's all. Well, that's very nice of you. The deal is you give us the combination. I know he's got a lot of other stuff in there he wants besides the money, but that's all I want, the money. What's your proposition? Give us the combination. We'll leave the stuff where it can be picked up without getting hurt. We'll leave the whole safe. And if you don't get it? If we don't get it, the safe winds up the bottom of the river. And Rostolis never sees anything else he's got in there. And that's fair, is it? How fair can you get all right, hold the phone a minute. Now, talk it over with Mr. Rostow. No, no, I don't hold any phone. I'll call you back. Captain who? Captain Cronin, 21st Precinct. All right, I'll call you back there. Hello? Hello? What's the trouble, Captain? Well, that was a burglar. A burglar? Did you say it was a burglar on the phone? Oh, that's who he said it was. What does he want? A combination to the safe. The what? Who does he think he is? He can't get it open. He said if he gets the combination, you'll recover everything else in the safe except the money. All he wants is the money. If he doesn't get it, he says, the whole thing goes to the bottom of the river. You mean I could get my accounts receivable and my war bonds back? That's what he said. Well, who cares about the money? I'm covered by insurance for that. I'll go along with him. I'm inclined to do that. Well, I don't know whether I will, Mr. Restore. Now, look, whose stuff is it? I've got a lot to lose. We'll talk it over with the detectives. They'll be here soon to see what they want to do about it. Well, I know what I want to do about it. I've been a long time in this job, Captain. I never heard of anything like this before. I oh, learn something new every day, Sergeant. Every day in the year. Within a few minutes, detectives of both the 21st Squad and the Safe Lofts and Truck Squad, the Central Office Specialists who handle safe burglaries on a citywide basis, arrived at the scene. Sergeant Tierney gave them such information as he had collected, and I told them of the phone call from the man who purported to be one of the burglars. The detectives took over the investigation, and Sergeant Tierney instructed his men to resume patrol. I returned to the station house where I signed the blotter, Went into my office to read and sign reports and communications which had accumulated since I was last on duty. At 20 minutes after 10, I had almost finished the paperwork when I looked up and saw Lieutenant Matt King, commander of the 21st Detective Squad, and another man standing in the doorway. Yes, Matt. You got a minute, Captain? Yes, yeah, sure. Come in. How are you, Captain Farmer? This is Detective Gordon Sawyer of the Safe and Lost Squad. Glad to know you, Sawyer. Yes, sir. Sit down. Matt, sit down. Yeah. Come on, sit down. 
Well, that was an odd one this morning, wasn't it? Yeah, it sure was. How do you figure it, Sawyer? You fellas ever hear of anything like that before? No, sir. It's new to us. Guy must be a psycho trying to swing a deal like that. Well, he didn't sound much like a psycho on the phone, Matt. How are you fellas going to figure, Sawyer? Well, a couple of things, Captain. Uh, one, Mr. Restola said it was a woman on the phone when he answered, and you picked it up, and it was a man. That's right. Two, from the description Ristolas gave us of the box, it sounded like a certified 600. Now, a safe man who really knows his business wouldn't find much trouble getting into a box like that. He'd try ripping it, and if that didn't work, he'd use a cutting torch, get inside of it that way, especially since they carried it off and can work on it at their leisure. They aren't red-hot iron men, that's for sure. Whoever they are, I don't think they've been long in the trade. How many of them you think there were? Well, that box weighs 600 pounds. There must have been at least three of them, maybe four. Mm. And what about the girl on the phone? I don't know, Captain. I think I've got an idea about that. Yes, sir? If this burglar is going to put the proposition to someone, who would be the logical person? Not the policeman on the job. The logical one would have been Ristolas. I don't think he wanted to talk to Ristolas. That's why he... That's why you had the girl put in the call. You mean you think Ristolas might have recognized his wife? Yeah, might have. Yes, sir, that's a good possibility. But uh, why the girl? There must have been at least two other men in the deal. Why the girl? I don't know. Maybe his friends didn't think it was a good idea. Maybe they gave up on the deal when they couldn't get the box open. No, well, any number of reasons. Sawyer, let's check out some of the people Ristolas knows. Okay, Lieutenant. He, uh, he said he used to have help in the store, but not anymore. How about his former employees? Yes, sir, there might be something there. You going to be around here all day, Captain? Oh, I was going out on patrol again this afternoon. That's about all. Why? Well, we figured this bum might call back here to see if the deal will go through. And if he does, we've got the switchboard here. One of us will be right out there. We'll keep one line open to the telephone company to get the location of the phone he's calling from. As soon as we can get the location, we'll have a car go right over there. He won't stay on the phone long. He wouldn't this morning. He knows we're looking for his call. Oh, well, he's got to stay on long enough for you to give him the combination. And uh, you want to go along with him? Well, part way. We'll give him a phony combination. That might give us a chance to get to him. If you take long enough to tell it to him, Captain. I'll take long enough. So we'll be out at the board and start to work on every call that comes through to you, Captain, if that's all right. Yeah, that's yeah, all right. Uh, if you'll just take a few seconds longer to get to the phone than you normally do, we might have a chance. If he calls again. Well, he's got the safe and we've got the combination. If he had the nerve to carry that safe out across the sidewalk, he's certainly got nerve enough to make another telephone call. You are listening to 21st Precinct, a factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city. This year, there's something brand new in campaign news coverage, an innovation by CBS News, which is always on the lookout for new ways to illuminate and enlarge its news reporting. It's the CBS News Campaign Cavalcade, a 12-man unit of top CBS newsmen which will be touring America in two specially designed and equipped station wagons. Heading always for on-the-spot coverage wherever political news is breaking. Perhaps the cavalcade has already visited your locality. Perhaps it's on its way right now to cover the political situation there, not only from the candidate's point of view, but yours. Be on the lookout for it, for the CBS News campaign cavalcade is on its way. And now back to Captain Cronin and the 21st Precinct. I remained at the station house for the balance of the morning. Detective Sawyer of the Safe and Lost Squad posted himself next to the telephone switchboard, ready to use another line to trace any subsequent call from the safe burglar. He got head starts on two callers who had asked for me, but both of them turned out to be ordinary police business. At 11 o'clock, Patrolman White, who had worked the 12 to 8 tour on the post where the safe burglary occurred, came into the precinct house and stopped to talk to the desk officer. About the same time, I finished my paperwork and started out of the office into the muster room. I saw Patrolman White and asked him to come into my office. What are you doing back in the house, White? Weren't you off at 8 o'clock this morning? Uh, yes, sir, but I had to go to court on an old case, and I left something here I wanted to pick up. Come on inside. Yes, sir. You were assigned to post number 6 from midnight to 8 a.m., is that right? Yes, sir, that's right. You're familiar with the paint store on Lexington Avenue run by Mr. Peter Ristolas? Yeah, that's on uh, post number six, Captain. You have occasion to notice anything unusual at the paint store during your tour, do you? No, sir. You try the front door at all during your tour? Well, I did on my first time around. You saw nothing unusual during the balance of your tour? No, sir. Did you notice any truck parked on your post near the store? No, sir. White, 
Sometime during the night, burglars jimmied the front door, got in the store, rolled out a 600-pound safe. They did? I'm telling you they did. Rolled it out the front door, crossed the sidewalk into a truck. Where were you? Well, I didn't see them. I know you didn't see them. I'm trying to find out why. Yes, sir. After your first time around, didn't you try the door again during the course of the tour? No, sir. Well, why not? Can you explain why you didn't? Yes, sir. Well, go ahead, explain. That's what I'm waiting for. Well, a little after one o'clock, there was some trouble over in a bar on 3rd Avenue. What kind of trouble? Oh, two of the patrons got in a fight, Captain. One of them hit the other over the head with a beer bottle. The man was unconscious, and I had to go to the hospital with him. What time did you get back on post? At 2.23, Captain. Did you start around again? Yes, sir. Did you try any front doors? Well, I started to, but it was along about that time that the alarm hit for this fire in the old brewery on the river. Yeah. Well, Sergeant Collins drove by and instructed me to leave my post and go over to York Avenue. Well, what did you do then? Well, the firemen had lines strung across York Avenue. There were about 30 pieces of apparatus there. I was instructed to reroute traffic off York Avenue and on to 1st and 2nd. Mm, how long did you stay there? Until I was relieved. What time was that? 20 minutes after 8 o'clock this morning. I came into the station house, changed into my civilian clothes, and I went down to court. That's where I was until I got back here. Okay, Wayne. Go on home. Yes, sir. Thank you, Captain. Bye, Captain. All right, leave the door open. 21st Precinct, Captain Cronin. This is Joyer, Captain. There's a call coming through for you. I think it's our boy. All right. If you'll hang up and let it ring three or four times. Okay. Thank Captain Cronin. Now, you know who this is, Captain? I think so. Well, what about the deal? You ready to go through with it? I think so. Well, what's the combination? Now, now, wait a minute. Look, first, I want your assurance that you're not going to throw that safe in the river. The man wants his property back. You get it back. Well, I just want to make well, sure that you're not going to... do. You're trying to stall for time. I'm not going to stay on this line long enough for you to trace the call. Believe me, I'm not. Now, what's the combination? All right, uh, just a second, now. Let me find it, huh? Take more than a second. I'm telling you. Don't take more than a second. All right, all right. I'm getting it. Just a second. I'm telling you. All right, hold it. Yeah, here, here it is. What? Let's see. Uh, two full turns to the right. Uh, two full turns to the right. Write that down, huh? And stop at 71. Stop at 71. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, back left past 71, uh, stop at 6. Back left past 71, stop at 6. Uh, what? what? 6, 6. Yeah, then what? Now, look, uh, look you're going to keep your promise, aren't you? I'll keep my promise if you'll keep yours. What's the rest of the combination? I haven't got all day here. I know what you're trying to do. All right. And, uh, right, right to 98. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, goodbye. <laughs> I think we got a chance, Captain. Oh, well, I couldn't keep him on the phone any longer, Sawyer. He knew what we were up to. We made it. Good. The, uh, girl was with him again. Apparently, she was standing right alongside him and taking down the combination as he repeated it. It was from a pay station. No, uh, that's for you. A drugstore on Astoria Boulevard. A car from 114th is on the way. Good. Maybe they'll make it. I'll call the squad out there and ask him to take a look, too. Okay. I'll do it from the board. Oh, excuse me, Lieutenant. It's all right. Go ahead. We got the call, Lieutenant. You talked to him, Captain? Yeah, I'm out. I gave him the combination. They traced it to a pay station in a drugstore on Astoria Boulevard. Yeah, well, he's probably gone by now. Yeah, well, the car's on the way. So he's calling the 114th squad and having them take a look, too. Astoria, huh? That's yes, right. You know something, Captain? I had Vitaly and Novak over there talking to that Mr. Rostolis for the better part of the morning. Yeah. We've been going on the possibility that maybe your suggestion is correct. The man didn't want to talk to Rostolis on the phone because he might recognize the voice. They asked him all about his former employees and friends and relatives, anybody that he knew who was familiar with the store or worked there. Did they get anywhere? No, no place much, but one thing came out. Oh, what's that? Rostolis' wife has a brother who's been in a little trouble. Oh, that's so. Yeah, he did one bit for Grand Larceny. He's been out for two and a half, three years. He hasn't got jammed up since. The solar said his brother-in-law used to clerk in the store on Saturdays once in a while. No, just to help him out a little bit in the rush. He said he wasn't much account as a clerk, though. He didn't know varnish from enamel. Said he hasn't seen his brother-in-law in about seven or eight months. Doesn't think his wife has either. Well, it's, it's nothing in itself. Rostolis would know his brother-in-law's voice over the telephone. Yeah. And his brother-in-law might think that Rostolis is a pretty good mark. 
Well, it's a possibility, Matt, but I still don't have much. Hmm. Do you know where he lives? The brother-in-law? Nestoria? Yeah. Nestoria. Well, I guess you want to talk to him. Yes, sir. I guess we do. In another minute or so, Detective Sawyer came into my office and told me that he had spoken to the acting lieutenant in command of the 114th Squad. Two detectives from there were en route to the drugstore on Astoria Boulevard to see if they could locate the caller. It was determined that Detective Sawyer, accompanied by Detective Vitale of the 21st Squad, would go to Astoria and talk to the brother-in-law of the victim. The fact that the brother-in-law lived in Astoria and had a criminal record was considered more than a coincidence. After they left my office, I turned my attention to other business of the precinct. At 1 p.m., I went out on patrol and returned in time to turn out the platoon for the night tour at 4. The precinct was calmer than when I came on the job in the morning. The storm had abated. After the men marched out the door, a call came from upstairs that Lieutenant King would like to see me in the detective squad office. I walked through the back door where several of the men who had just come off duty were standing around talking, climbed the rickety stairs to the second floor, and walked into the 21st squad. Detective Sawyer was sitting on the edge of a desk talking to a small blonde woman. I walked over to him. Well, I was just doing him a favor. That's all I was doing. Sawyer? Oh, hello, Captain. How are you? After all, all he asked me to do was make a telephone call for him. If a girl can't make a telephone call for a man, well, well what's this girl coming to? Captain, this is Eleanor Mohall. How do you do? I'm sure. I didn't have anything to do with breaking into that store. I wasn't anywhere near the place. I didn't know what it was all about. He asked me to do him a favor, that's all, and I did. I didn't know what it was all about. He asked you to write the combination down, too, when he got it from the captain here. You knew what that was all about, didn't you? Well, not exactly. He's not the kind that tells you everything. You uh, got it about wrapped up, sir? Uh, yes, uh, pretty much. Vitelli and I went to this house in Astoria. We found the brother-in-law out there and uh, her. I told you. I was just visiting. That's all I was doing. I was just visiting. We took a look in the garage, and what do you think was there? The safe. Yes, sir, the safe. I didn't know it was in there. Kind of looking garages. Why should I look in a garage? I was just visiting him, and he asked me to do him a favor. You can't tell somebody for doing a favor. Oh, where's the lieutenant in his office? Yes, sir. I didn't know what it was all about. That's the honest to goodness truth. He asked me to do him a favor. That's yeah, all. Yeah, Captain Carlin. I wasn't anywhere near the place. I just did him all a favor. All right. I thought you'd like to meet this man, Captain. You talked to him over the phone, Lee Kangley. What are we waiting for? You got the safe, you got me. Book me and get it over with, will you? I'm tired. Says you were up all last night? Because I was up all last night, yeah. It was a very smart thing you did, breaking into your brother-in-law's store, wasn't it? Oh, that was smart enough. The stupid thing was leaving a safe in my garage. I should have found some place else. Did you find out who was with him on the deal last night, man? Yes, sir. He told us. Still, I told you. I told you everything. Why should I keep anything back? They walked out of me. You think I want to be in and them out? Not me, brother. I weak and easy. When I go down for the third time, I take everybody with me. Why did you pick on your own brother-in-law? I wanted to keep the money in the family. I was very thoughtful, wasn't it, Captain? Very. We're sending a truck out after the safe, Captain. I'm kind of anxious to see it. Sawyer told me they clawed at it and hacked at it and burned it with a torch to try to knock the knob off. They couldn't make a dent in it. It must be a pre-war safe. Do they build them like that today? I'll say they don't. Who's got a chance of one of those things? And it's work. You know that's work to get it out of the store, onto the truck, and out to the garage, then to have to go to work on it? You know we worked on that thing from 2.30 this morning till almost 8. We couldn't make a dent in it? Is that when you got the bright idea to call me? Yeah, that's right. I came over to New York, walked down the other side of Lexington Avenue to see what kind of a rumble there was from the deal. When I saw all the cops parked out in front, I went in a candy store and called. Well, who was with you? Just Eleanor? Yeah, that's right, just Eleanor. I had the idea out in the garage, but the other boys thought I was crazy. They wouldn't have any part of it. I said to them, look, I'm not two feet away from where all that money is. Not two feet, and I can't get my hands on it. If you don't want any part in it, get out. I said to myself, I'll do it myself. And they got out. All that work, not a dime out of it. That's what gets me backbreaking work. Are you going to bring them in here, those boys? I'd like to see the looks in their faces. They take a fall, don't get a dime out of it. I'm laughing. It's a big joke. All right. Come in, Mr. Stoller. Yeah. I'm Lieutenant King. How are you? I'm pleased to know you. Lee, I, I don't know what to say. Say hello. I'm ashamed of you, Lee. I'm really ashamed of you. My wife's own brother to do such a thing to me. What do you want from me, Pete? I did it. What am I going to do? Say I'm sorry? You would really throw the safe in the river? 
Your own brother-in-law's accounts receivable in bonds at the bottom of the river? I can understand how you would do it to me, but your own flesh and blood is my wife. Don't knock yourself out, Pete, will you? Why did you do it, Lee? Why didn't you come to me if you needed money? I needed money, but who needed a song and dance along with it, Captain? Do you understand it? I don't. A grown man, look at him. In his trade, he can go out and make $25 a day. $25 a day, and he's got to go get himself in trouble like this again. What's the answer? $25 a day. The answer, Mr. Restola, seems to be that he prefers night work. Twenty first person, Sergeant Kenny. Who's dead? Who? How? Where is this? Where? Eighty eighty SWAT? Yeah. Yeah, who is this? And so it goes. Around the clock, through the week, every day, every year. A police precinct in the city of New York is a flesh-and-blood merry-go-round. Anyone can catch the brass ring. Or the brass ring can catch anyone. 21st Precinct transcribed. A factual account of the way police work in the world's largest city is presented with the official cooperation of the Patrolman's Benevolent Association, an organization of more than 20,000 members of the police department, city of New York. James Gregory in the role of Captain Cronin, Ken Lynch as Lieutenant King. Featured in tonight's cast were Joe DeSantis, John Sylvester, Miss Leslie Wood, Bill Quinn, Larry Haynes, and Eric Dressler. 21st Precinct is written, produced, and directed by Stanley Niss. Roger Foster speaking. <laughs>